that okay? Can't hear yourself. Okay, so I'm really delighted to be able to be here and talk to you about a problem that has been occupying a lot of my time, the issue of, of abundance scaling relations at Redshift 2. Um, where I think we are, what we've learned over the last few years, problems we're still having, and some promising directions for um, moving forward. But I think before we begin, I think it's important to point out that I really hate the phrase mass metallicity relation because I feel like it obscures what we're actually talking about. Metallicity, of course, has a very specific definition for astronomers, but I would wager that this is not how every astronomer actually thinks about metallicity. This audience might actually be a special case because it's a lot of theorists, and I think most of you probably think that, but in uh, my informal polling of people over the last year or so, uh, there's actually quite a diversity of opinion. Do you think Z, the mass fraction of things uh, heavier than uh, hydrogen and helium? Do you think oxygen? Do you think iron? And this is really important. And the reason for that is because observationally, we think very specific things when we say mass metallicity relation, as exemplified by what is perhaps one of the most shown plots of the mass metallicity relation, I think, in the history of astronomy, which is from Christy Tremonti's work um, with Sloan in 2004. And what makes this uh, scaling relation so useful is that it encodes a lot of information about how galaxies assembled themselves. On the x-axis, you have uh, stellar mass, but this is related to the integral of star formation or maybe the age of the galaxy or the halo uh, mass. And on the y-axis, we have something that's probing the, um, the number of stars that have been formed and returned oxygen to the ISM. We have issues of gas mass, maybe um, loading factors or metallicity of outflows. Um, and so the details of this, the normalization, the slope, the shape, the scatter, can tell us about, you know, all of these things that galaxies are doing as they convert their gas to stars and sort of continue along. But we actually see this in more than one tracer. So um, if this is what uh, emission line galaxy people like me think about, uh, we also have evidence of a mass metallicity relation in, uh, from the stars themselves, so looking at iron in stars. So work by Galazzi um, with Sloan and then extending it many uh, decades lower to uh, local dwarf galaxies in Evan Kirby's work. Furthermore, we know that the mass metallicity relation or the mass oxygen abundance relation evolves with redshift, or rather that it is different at different redshifts, I should be more precise. Um, on the left is a, a figure from Don Erb's work in 2006, maybe one of the first high redshift, you know, relatively high redshift um, examples of this kind of analysis, showing Sloan um, and then stacks of redshift two galaxies, um, here using the N2 over H alpha indicator. Um, and this is generally interpreted as an increase in the uh, gas reservoir in galaxies at fixed stellar mass at higher redshift. And this is generally also the interpretation of something called the fundamental metallicity relation, um, popularized by Minucci et al., where you can see this three-parameter surface connecting uh, stellar mass, oxygen abundance, and star formation rate, here a proxy for the amount of gas in galaxies. These are all bins of Sloan galaxies, and here you have sort of work by uh, Dawn and others at high redshift. But basically, most of this is defined, the shape of the surface is defined by redshift zero, with a little bit at redshift two. But the change between these epochs is also important for understanding the way that galaxies evolve. Um, and one way that we've sought to make this connection between observations and physics is to compare um, the observations with predictions from simulations. So we have a couple plots from Zhang Jing Ma's work uh, with fire on the left showing redshift zero um, from Christy Tremonti's work and then from the simulations and on the bottom we have redshift two. So Don Erbs is the yellow and then a couple more recent ones from uh, KBSS and MOSDEF, two large surveys that were conducted with MOSFIRE at Redshift 2, and again, uh, the FIRE simulation. And on the right, predictions from illustrious TNG, from Paul Torrey's work. Um, and the interpretation of the slope is generally thought to tell you something about the efficiency of metal retention or feedback as a function of stellar mass. Um, and what's really exciting I thought about Paul's work was the attempt to simultaneously explain the shift in the normalization, the slope, but also the scatter, and we'll come back to that later. What you might notice is there's a pretty 
you know, things look pretty good between the data and the simulations, but there are definitely some issues. In particular, I think you'll notice that the slopes are pretty different between the data, which is here red, and the simulations. And so the reason for this might be that there's something wrong with the simulations, but I would argue that we are also still struggling to know if we're actually measuring oxygen abundance correctly at all redshifts in a way that makes it easy for simulators to make these kinds of comparisons. So we have to take a step back to our astrophysics uh, grad classes and think about, well, what, how are we measuring oxygen abundance in galaxies? And it's basically by looking at indirect tracers of chemical abundance from H2 regions. Well, mostly indirect. Uh, so an H2 region, generally just a massive galactic uh, or extragalactic light bulb um, where you're seeing emission from hydrogen, illuminated, photoionized, uh, by the central mass of stars. This is emission modulated primarily by the number of ionizing photons. But there's also a series of uh, metal lines which tell you about the ionization state, the gas temperature, the gas abundance. And ideally what you would do actually is look at a temperature sensitive line and say, okay, this is the temperature of the gas. We know that metals are the coolants, thus we can estimate the metallicity. The problem is, is these features are very, very faint. And so instead, what we've been forced to do is look at calibration samples where we can make electron temperature measurements and then correlate with those, correlate with those stronger lines and emission line ratios and then apply those calibrations to other samples where maybe things are the same, maybe things aren't. And the reason why I want to point this out, um, so this is sort of a classic uh, pair of plots from Patini and Pagel showing uh, the electron temperature method estimated oxygen abundance versus two line ratios. There is a fair amount of scatter around the best fit line, um, and this scatter is going to be correlated with other physical parameters that may be of interest. For example, the nitrogen abundance or the ionization parameter. Um, but when you take the calibration for these and apply to um, a different sample, all you're looking at is this one-to-one -one relation. All that information um, gets lost. So um, the reason why this is something that we've worried about at high redshift is because we had um, really conclusive evidence a few years ago that high redshift galaxies had nebular emission line patterns that were distinct from local galaxies. And the best example of this is the BPT diagram, where we see high redshift galaxies, green points in both plots, significantly offset from the location of star forming galaxies in the local universe. And although we were puzzled about this and we thought about this um, a lot, you can go and look at the record of this in the literature, we've basically concluded that the big difference is that high redshift galaxies are generally alpha enhanced. They have super solar oxygen to iron ratios as a result of rising um, star formation histories and the significant impact of recent star formation. So on the left is a, is a figure showing that typical high redshift galaxies have oxygen to iron at fixed oxygen abundance consistent with bulge and thickness stars in the Milky Way. And on the right is a plot that Casey showed earlier in the week from a paper of mine from last year showing the estimated oxygen to iron for a whole population of redshift two galaxies. So this elevated oxygen to iron is consistent with ISM that's been enriched primarily by core collapse supernovae, and is also what we see in the centers of nearby giant ellipticals. And if you haven't seen a paper by Ryan Sanders that came out recently, he's also shown this to be true for a sample of redshift two galaxies, redshift two-ish galaxies um, with electron temperature measurements. So this is something we feel pretty confident about. The issue is, is that if you have alpha enhancement, what you can do is change all of your line ratios that you're using to measure oxygen abundance without actually changing the oxygen abundance. So now, you don't necessarily know if the tool you're using is actually giving you anything remotely related to the right answer. Um, on the upper right hand uh, corner, you can see two different line ratio techniques for, and then how they compare for a high redshift sample. Um, and these, these are based on local galaxies, and so there's a huge discrepancy for high redshift galaxies that are alpha enhanced. And the de degree of discrepancy is going to be related to the specific star formation rate. So basically how extreme the local um, star formation history has been. Now you can make an attempt to adjust for this by looking at extreme local galaxies, but the problem is, is there are no alpha enhanced oxygen rich massive stars in the local universe. And so the massive end of the calibration is always going to be systematically biased. So I've tried to get around this by looking at photoionization models. Um, and although there are many different methods to do this that are already available, many of which are quite um, uh, 
clever. Um, what I needed was something that I couldn't find, which was an ability to look at alpha enhancement um, in the abundance pattern. So what I did was I made predictions of line ratios as a function of oxygen abundance, iron abundance, um, nitrogen to oxygen abundance and ionization parameter, and I asked, well, what combination of those parameters best matches the observations of a sample of galaxies uh, that I assembled during my uh, thesis, the Keck Baryonic Structure Survey? Um, and I wrote a whole paper about that. I wish I could tell you more about that, but instead what I'm going to show you um, is the results uh, that it suggests for the mass metallicity relation. So on the left is something you're probably used to looking at. Um, this is the mass metallicity relation where oxygen abundance has been estimated using a strong line ratio, which I've already explained, may be biased. And on the right is what you get if you use the photoionization model um, that I created for use with this sample. And you can see there's a couple of striking differences. On the left, you have a pretty narrow um, sequence, pretty small measurement errors, pretty small intrinsic error. On the right, you see much larger measurement errors, um, much larger intrinsic scatter, um, and also a different normalization. And so if the three things that we're interested in knowing about a scaling relation, the slope, the normalization, and the scatter, differ between what we've typically been thinking about and what we typically compare with simulations and what might be actually more correct, this is kind of troubling. So to really drive home the point about how uncertain we are about the slope of the mass metallicity relation at redshift 2, I want to go back to just the line ratios. On the left is the same plot as before. The blue line is the best fit to uh, those green points. And uh, over top, I've plotted two mass metallicity relations from two different papers. Red is from a, a, a sample from Mostef. Uh, orange is from a sample uh, from a paper Chuck and I wrote back in 2014. And you'll see that they're very, very different. Um, and on the right, this may seem sort of uh, pedantic, but I've plotted the slope of the mass metallicity relation versus the coefficient in front of the line ratio in the calibration. And you'll see most of the difference here is actually just a difference in method. And to really drive the point home, if you take the same sample of green galaxies and just apply different calibrations, you're going to see a huge difference in the estimated slope. And each one of these calibrations is well made, motivated in its own way. So you should be very careful when you take a mass metallicity relation from an observer and try and compare it with your simulation, because what you might actually be looking at is just an uncertainty in the calibration method. OK, the other thing I want to talk about is the scatter. Um, and this is because um, it, the reason why we see very little scatter in a line ratio mass metallicity relation is because what we're essentially looking at is a projection of a surface of multiple uh, mass scaling relations. So here you can see that O3 and 2 is actually also highly correlated with ionization parameter. And so what you're looking at is a projection of mass, oxygen abundance, and ionization parameter space where using the model, you've explicitly taken that out. And you can still see the mass ionization parameter uh, relation, but it's not causing this artificially low scatter. And the reason why I think we need to be careful about this in an attempt to understand the scatter of these relations as robustly as we can is that it can actually tell us even more about the assembly history of galaxies. So this is just one example from a paper by Yorit Mathy where he was looking at the Eagle simulations showing that the predicted um, scatter in abundant scaling relations should be different depending on uh, the element that you're looking at. So iron, which is returned to the ISM on a much longer time scale, should have much higher scatter than something like oxygen, which essentially is immediately returned to the ISM. And this is actually something we see uh, with KVSS. So on the left, the oxygen abundance scaling relation. On the right, the iron abundance scaling relation, which is steeper, which is what you would expect if you wanted to see a decreasing oxygen to iron ratio towards higher stellar masses, but also has this higher um, scatter. The issue, of course, is that these results are highly model dependent, especially dependent on the input stellar population models. So one of the things that I've been working on lately is assembling a sample of uh, high signal to noise, high resolution uh, optical spectra of local analogs where you can simultaneously look at the strong line ratios, which are sampling this, uh, the ionizing radiation fields sort of across uh, this range where different stellar populations predict different shapes, but also where you can characterize the helium-2 emission, which is very sensitive to extreme um, um, physics for producing hard ionizing photons. It's 54.4 EV is required. Um, and so the, by combining this analysis, we should be able to place constraints on massive star models. And this is 
some work that Peter Senshin at, at Arizona has also been doing. And then finally, this issue of the normalization, which I kind of glossed over, is a long-standing issue between uh, sort of direct method, collisionally excited abundance scales, which tend to be much lower than recombination line scales. Um, and this is something that's probably going to have to await James Webb, where we have the sensitivity to go get multiple aurora line measurements for a representative sample of high redshift galaxies. 4363 is generally the gold standard, but it actually becomes, even for James Webb, kind of out of reach at relatively high, or it's sort of moderate oxygen abundances. Also, there's an issue of an iron line at 4360, um, which sort of comes up as you go towards higher oxygen abundances. But collectively, you should be able to sample a number of these uh, line ratios, or these lines with James Webb. So I will leave you with my conclusions and take any questions. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Allison? <laughs> uh, given that the gas we're looking at in most galaxies are a mixture of perhaps different metallicities mm -hmm. as well as conditions, yeah. looking into that, how good is it when we take a global or integrated view and then try to backtrack and say something about the overall evolution? I think that's a great question, and I, I think the answer is complicated, and it's different at different redshifts. At redshift two, I mean, so there's, there's the issue of different, different H2 regions you're looking at, but there's also the issue of ionized gas outside of H2 regions. At redshift two, we probably don't have to worry about the latter. The former is something I don't think we know the answer to yet. Uh, we can try and potentially forward model this issue of, you know, what does an integrated light spectrum look like if you're actually looking at a distribution of H2 regions. This is work that people are starting to think about. Um, but this is going to be one of the killer apps of the giant telescopes is being able to resolve the architecture of redshift two galaxies and tell us how bad these approximations are. Uh, do we have any other questions? So if you compare the, um, the evolution that you see in the H2 regions to what you see from uh, DLA samples, uh -huh. yeah, where there they don't have these ionization correction issues, but they probably have other issues. Yeah. So can you comment on that? Um, I'm honestly not super familiar with the results that you're mentioning, so maybe this is something that we can talk about okay. afterwards. Okay. All right, let's thank Allison again. <laughs> <laughs>